and welcome to The Rock. We are super excited that you are here today, especially all of you in these seats and those of you at home who are watching with us online. Um, if you're here for the very first time, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. You should have received a connection card when you walked in. And if you didn't, that's okay. There is a QR code on the inside of the access. You can go ahead and scan that with your smartphone and share your information. If you're a member of The Rock and you've been a member for a while and you have some new contact information, that's a great place for you to update that contact information, that QR code. We are uh, excited to have Pastor Cassie sharing with us today a message in our Building Together series. Right now we're going to go ahead and get into some worship. I really, really hope that each and every one of you 
came expecting to meet God here today because he is expecting to meet you here today. So if you would just take a moment to welcome him into your heart right now. Just take a moment to get yourself in a place where we can truly worship our Father. I'm gonna ask each and every one of you to stand if you are able as we get into worshiping our Father.
saw that God is good, even with the circumstance that she was in. And just listen to the, the chorus. It says there, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. So um, until, I think this was written in the 1800s and until now, um, it is being sung. And um, I hope you, the new generation would still sing hymnals because they are really um, pure um, when they wrote these songs, you know. So let's go ahead and uh, sing Tis So Sweet.
Is this one better? Oh, there we go. Okay, good morning, church. My name is Cassie. I'm the associate pastor here at The Rock, and I have the great privilege of sharing this morning's message with you. At this time, children and nursery age, you are dismissed to your classrooms. For everybody else, let's go ahead and bow for a quick word of prayer before we jump in. Father, here we are a body of believers assembled together to glorify your name. We pray that our offerings of worship, fellowship, and teaching this morning are pleasing to you. We give you thanks for your graciousness and faithfulness to us. And as these little ones go out, we ask for your hedge of protection over them, that they may grow in the knowledge of who you are. Guard their hearts, minds, and bodies from the evils of this world. And for us in this room and watching online, Lord, teach us to walk in the footsteps of Christ, equipping us for the good works you have predestined us to do. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, we are continuing our series on building together, if that's any surprise to you. And I know it can feel a little monotonous going through the same book for an extended period of time, but all joking aside, this is such a great way to build our discipline in our reading habits. And God's word is so incredibly rich that it's a shame when we skip over passages, assuming that they're just about long dead people who kind of did something interesting but have no real effect on us today. But that's not the case. What's the truth is, sitting with a story like Nehemiah for a while gives us time to chew on all of the little details we might have otherwise missed extracting every flavor and morsel of its wisdom. 
Now, if that still doesn't encourage you to get excited every Sunday, we're just about a third of the way there, folks. So if you could hang on a little bit longer, just don't give up now, please. It's worth it. Now, last week, Pastor Chris took us through the first half of chapter four, where the Jews have begun their work rebuilding the Jerusalem wall when their three main adversaries came along to berate them for their efforts. And they're hurling insults, ridicule, mockery, in an attempt to discourage the work of God's people from being completed. And at first, this only spurs the Jews on to work harder, and they end up building the entire wall around the city to half of its height. Now, for the record, the average height of the Jerusalem wall was about 12 meters, which, com which comes in just under 40 feet. So in a matter of weeks, they built this wall 20 feet high, 20 feet from that ground to the cross beam of the crosses up there. That's around 20 feet. That is an impressive thing to do. It says they worked with all of their hearts to accomplish this. Imagine if the same effort was placed into fixing the spaghetti bowl. We would be done by now. What a marvelous thing that would be. We're not, but it would be nice. Now, as PC pointed out in chapter four, when they hit that halfway mark, the mood changes completely. It's that moment when you've started a big project and worked at it with gusto, only to realize three hours later, you're only halfway done and you don't really feel like finishing. Uh, Dana Parrish, and I got her permission to share this story. Dana Parrish decided last week that she was going to clean the grout in her kitchen and living area. And she was sharing the whole saga with us over our small gathering group chat. And at first she was like, wow, look at this amazing crowd. It's so pretty and white. And we're like, yeah, I get it girl. And then it was four and a half hours later. She's like, I really regret my life decisions. I don't know if I should have done this. And then the chat went completely silent and I started to get nervous. Maybe I should go over to her house and just check. And the next day, she sends a message that she finally finished. And she scrubbed that full floor for 12 hours, and it looks incredible, but she was exhausted by the end of it. Now, not only were the Jews exhausted, they were also receiving a steady stream of reports from Jews that lived in surrounding areas that the enemy was planning an attack. So at this point, they've been working for weeks. We know from the text that they started around the Hebrew month of Ab, and will eventually, spoiler alert, finish in the month of Elul. Now on our calendar, that's July through September. <laughs> Gross, that's a terrible time to be working. It's hot, it's humid, they've been doing backbreaking labor, and the enemy surrounds them completely. The morale was at an all time low. And that is where we're picking up in our text this morning. So let's read together Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 13 through 23. This is Nehemiah speaking. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemy heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we returned to the wall, each to our own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out. We are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so that they can serve as guards by night and as workers by day. Neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon even when he went for water. I want to consider for a moment not only the godly wisdom of this chapter, but also of the practicality of Nehemiah's leadership. His people are vulnerable. With broken walls and tired bodies, they are sitting ducks 
in the eyes of their enemies. But instead of letting fear overcome the work, he admonishes them saying, remember who you serve and what's really at stake here. Put a pin in that. We'll come back to it later. Nehemiah then splits everyone into two groups. You have the builders and the watchmen. And the watchmen stood tall behind the builders day in and day out, eyes fixed steadily on the horizon, waiting for the first sign of trouble. They had bows and spears, armors and shields, ready to defend the city at a moment's notice. Meanwhile, the builders carried swords on their hips as they labored for hours with brick and mortar. Verse 21 says that they worked from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. In Jerusalem, in July, that's about 5 a.m. to 8 p.m. These men were pulling 15-hour days, watching and working and waiting. And at night, they slept inside the city to keep an eye on things, never letting their guard down, even when they went to go get a drink of water. Now, there are two extreme ends a Christian might find him or herself on when it comes to vigilance. So on one extreme end, you trust that God will take care of you to the point of just being ignorant about it. Because when we're on this end, we don't think that God requires any discernment or effort on our part. So this can lead us to making poor financial decisions, refusing to plan for the future, uh, neglecting our own health, that kind of stuff. And on the other end of the spectrum, the other extreme end, we become creatures riddled with constant anxiety that we have to plan for every little possible danger that can come our way. So if you're on this end, you might be hoarding resources or refusing to take any risks. Maybe you don't even take your problems to God in prayer because you think that you haven't done enough of your own part that God would concern himself with what you're going through. Now, neither of these extreme ends are healthy, nor are they biblical. We are called to hold in tension our faith in God and our willingness to work hard. So yes, I can trust that God will provide for my family, but that doesn't mean that Jaron and I can just quit our jobs. That's not how it works. We have to work. And yes, you can trust that God has complete sovereignty over your life. But if you shut your eyes and wander into a busy freeway, he's probably going to hand you over to the consequences of your choices. There is a middle place of preparedness where we honor God as having the final say while also using the brains he gave us to make wise decisions. And that is where we find Nehemiah depending on the Lord to fight their battles while instructing his men to stay ready for a skirmish at any moment. Pastor Chris mentioned the last few weeks that uh, every service we keep a security person posted out in the lobby. Is it because we're expecting problems? Have there been threats made against the church? No. Why is he out there? It's because when problems do arise, it's too late to get ready. Nehemiah understood that your most dangerous enemy is the one you're not prepared for. Christian, you are going to have enemies in your life. You have plenty of opposition coming from plenty of people. Sometimes you'll deserve it. Sometimes you won't. But for the most part, it's all bark and no bite. So don't get wrapped up in the drama of it. Hand that person over to the Lord and continue on with yourself. But there is one real enemy that we need to be aware of, ever mindful of, and that is our adversary, the devil. Scripture says that he is our accuser, that he prowls about like a hungry lion seeking for someone to devour. Imagine with me for a moment, you are at a zoo and you're enjoying your time. And suddenly a panicked voice comes over the intercom that the lions have escaped their habitat. I don't know about you, I am about to break a land speed record. I am out of there. (laughs) Dust. People would be locking themselves in bathrooms and jumping into fish tanks and snatching up their children because there has been a shift in the food chain and you are no longer at the top of it. Your head is going to be on a swivel. You are looking and listening and waiting for all of the cues so you can have enough time to get back to your car as safely as possible. But what if we were this enthusiastic about our spiritual well-being? 
After all, there's a lion prowling about, waiting to eat us alive. What are we doing to prepare ourselves for those battles? Because they're coming. Being in God's word, scrutinizing the media that we consume, uh, praying, fasting, even taking care of our physical health through exercise and eating well. These are all types of ways we can get in a headspace where we can see temptation coming and be ready to face it. Our God will fight our battles, but we still need to put on that armor. Now, there's an important difference here between an earthly lion and the devil. It's totally reasonable to be afraid of an actual lion. I encourage even a healthy fear of giant predaceous cats. That's just good habit. Satan, no. Don't worry about that guy. We serve a crucified Christ who holds the keys of death and Hades. If the devil wants to touch us, he has to go through Jesus first. But listen, Satan knows that he can't touch us. He knows he can't destroy us. So he depends on us destroying ourselves. He's used the same playbook since Genesis. Little seeds of doubt that he plants in our hearts saying, well, did God really say that? Is sin really that bad for you? If we listen to those lies long enough, we start returning to the very sin that Christ has freed us from. But we know our enemy. We understand his tactics. So where do we go from here? We leverage it against him. The Greek philosopher Plutarch wrote a fascinating piece called How to Profit by One's Enemies. I recommend it. It's a little dense, but I thought it was super cool to go through. And the whole idea of this essay is that having enemies can be a good thing because it makes you a more formidable fighter. Obviously, Plutarch was talking about the human militaristic type of enemy, but it's interesting nonetheless how much overlap there is when dealing with our spiritual enemy. So Plutarch's first reason having an enemy is be beneficial is that it is cause for self-examination. He writes, it'll be up on the board for you. Your enemy, wide awake, is constantly lying in wait to take advantage of your actions and seeking to gain some hold on you and keeping a constant patrol about your life, your enemy, plays the detective on your actions and digs his way into your plans and searches them through and through. A true enemy will search every corner of your life, looking for ways to tear you down so you had better know where those places are before he does. Nehemiah understood this well. The weak spots he had included a, a, literally a broken wall. He had tired builders who weren't even stonemasons in the first place. Nehemiah saw his enemies watching. He knew he couldn't afford to miss identifying every little place they might slip past to destroy the Jews. Let me ask you, where in your life are the places that you need to fortify against the attacks of Satan? Be scrupulous in your self-reflection and ask God to help you see your weaknesses. The second point Plutarch provides is that the presence of an enemy makes us abandon all things that give him the upper hand. If I could get slide six, please. He writes, when men keep always ready in mind the thought that the enemy would have cause for rejoicing, it causes them to turn around and abandon such things that give their enemies occasion for rejoicing and derision. A true enemy wants to celebrate your failures. That's why they're your enemy. Can you imagine the look on Sanballat and Tobiah's faces when they were able to momentarily discourage the builders earlier in this chapter? They were probably giggling like schoolgirls over their victory, right? But instead of abandoning their work at the first sign of trouble, Nehemiah encourages his people to remember why they are there and then sends them back to their station with weapons in hand. In the same way, we must resist the urge to return to old sins as fervently as possible. But even when we do mess up, and we will, the best thing that we can do is get back to business and wipe that smirk off of the enemy's face. Give him no occasion for rejoicing and derision. The third and final point that we can draw from Plutarch's essay is that having an enemy deepens the camaraderie we share with our friends. 
He says, this fact as it seems, a statement, Demas by name, advised his party associates not to banish all their opponents, but to leave some behind. In order, he said, that we may not begin to quarrel with our friends after being completely rid of our enemies. The Jews in Jerusalem at this point had been scattered for several generations. Their customs and shared identities had been lost over the years. But one of the few things that they could all agree on was that they could not let their enemy breach the city walls. And I'm sure there were plenty of opportunities for uh, people to get on each other's nerves during 15-hour work days. But the fear of an attack was the glue they needed to stick together throughout the process. Consider the myriad of silly things, hate to go here, that churches fight over. Pews or chairs, a cappella or full band, loafers or flip flops. <gasps> stupid. These are stupid, silly little things that threaten to tear the body of Christ apart. Because it makes us take our eyes off of the real threat, which is sin, and place it on the things that have zero eternal significance. For all the married folk in this room, uh, think about the moments that you and your spouse get heated. I'm willing to bet a lot of those times it had more to do with somebody being hangry or tired than there actually being something worth arguing about on the table. Yeah, oh, amen. <laughs> Godly churches and godly families must remember it's not you versus me. It's us versus sin. Earlier we said, uh, we circle back to Nehemiah's admonition. Let's do that now. Verse 14 says, remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. This right here, this verse is the point of the entire book. Keep your eyes on him and be willing to fight for the people he's entrusted to you. Friend, you are not the only one that the enemy is after. Your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your husbands are threats to the kingdom of darkness when they serve a living God. Are you standing behind them? guarded and armored, watching that they aren't overcome by the adversary. And in those times, what is the weapon that we wield? It's the word of God. Hebrew tells us the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing soul and spirit, joints from marrow, and it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart, knowing the enemy and shoring up our battle lines, our defensive maneuvers. But being in scripture puts us on the offensive. When you speak truth over your family, allowing your heart to be changed by the spirit, you are waging war against the principalities and powers that seek to destroy mankind. But remember, it doesn't matter if you have the sharpest, biggest, shiniest sword in all of the land. If you leave it at home on a shelf, it's not going to help you. It says that Nehemiah's men carried their swords wherever they went, even to get a drink of water, because they understood that the enemy could have shown up at any moment, and they needed to be ready. So for us, that means being in the word, uh, studying it, committing what it says to heart, is how we carry with us that sword wherever we go. And in time, it's amazing, you'll begin to discern what's going on around you with more clarity. You'll start to say, wait, I read about this man, that sounds just like the story of so-and-so. It's amazing how much easier it becomes to recognize the work of the enemy when you spend time in God's word. Because like I said earlier, he's been using the same strategy for thousands of years. He doesn't really have a new thought these days. The wall of Jerusalem could not have been finished without the protection of the sword, and neither could it have been finished without the work of the hands. If you're like me, when you read this passage, you thought, hmm, well, if I had to pick one job, I would want to be the guy with the sword because he just stands there all day while the other guy has to build a wall. I'm not saying that the guard wasn't doing important work. I'm just saying it doesn't feel equitable. I want to be the guy holding the sword because holding a shovel doesn't feel as glamorous as holding a sword. A shovel is covered in dust and sweat. The terrain it passes through chips away at the edges and bends its blade. 
Each of us have shovels with which we are to build the kingdom of God. Maybe it's your nine to five job where he's called you to witness to your coworkers and customers. I want to encourage you, do your job well. Because at the end of the day, it's not about the performance metrics that you hit or the commissions that you earned. It's about the people that you were in front of as a witness of Christ, as an example of godliness. Maybe your shovel is managing the home. The task before you is so much bigger than cooking dinner or hosting guests. You are called to foster an environment where all who enter are safe and cared for. It's a high purpose to watch over the affairs of your home, one that the Bible does not take lightly, even more so if there are children involved. Maybe your shovel is being a student and it can feel like all you ever do is dream of of your graduation and do assignments and listen to boring lectures, but I want to encourage you that it's not just about graduation or lectures. The things you are learning today are priming you to step into the real world and encounter a margin of people that a lot of us in this room will never get to know or witness to. Do your work well today because who knows what tomorrow holds for you. It can be so easy to overlook the eternal value of our work when it's day in and day out of the same thing over and over and over again. Yet, when we look back on the years, we begin to notice a pattern of how the Lord was using the work of our hands to further his kingdom. And when you leave this earth, what will the culmination of your life's work be? Will you have little sand castles all over? that represent the passing fancies you held, but will get swept away in the next wave? Or will it look like a a kingdom built on the solid foundation of Christ, one steeped in a legacy of truth and goodness? Thousands of years have passed since Nehemiah's uh, Nehemiah's men built the wall of Jerusalem. And it's, we're talking about it today because they dedicated themselves to something that mattered. Did you know that they uncovered this wall in February of 2007? That's a long time and some good craftsmanship for it to last that long. It makes it not only a really cool archeological find, but it's just one more piece that shows the authority of scripture. Hear me when I say this, that God isn't done with us yet. There is a work he has placed in each of our lives. The question is if we're willing to roll up our sleeves and get to it. There's a curious little detail in verse 18. After Nehemiah sends everyone back to their work sites, he makes a caveat saying, but the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. You see, Nehemiah was mobile throughout this entire process, going from site to site in order to keep a pulse on everything that was happening. And if there was any news of an attack or maybe even an enemy spotted in the distance, the news would go to him first. So having a trumpeter by his side ensured the quickest possible response time for the builders who were scattered all over the city. They were told, hey, do your work. If you hear the trumpet, get there immediately. Drop what you're doing. Come help us fight. No matter what you and I have been called to do individually, belonging to the body of Christ means that we can trust the community will come to our aid if things get dicey. When we fall into spiritual warfare, we need to be crying out for our brothers and sisters to come around us. Are you falling into old sin? Sound the alarm. Is your mental health declining? Blare the trumpet. If you think your marriage is under attack, summon the prayer warriors. And I know pride says, well, don't let anyone know you're struggling. You should be better than that. We're embarrassed of the places we don't have it all together. But don't forget, the enemy has an advantage over us when we choose to fight those things alone. Let's take a chapter out of Nehemiah's book and alert the co-laborers at the first sign of trouble. Now to close us out, in all of Nehemiah, whether we're admiring the military strategy or the devotion to God's word, it is vital that we remember that you and I are not the hero of this story. We're not the Nehemiah. I'm sorry to break it to you, took four chapters. We're not Nehemiah. 
We are just the laborers conscripted to carry out a monumental task. But even Nehemiah was only a shadow of the perfect leader that we would have in Jesus. Have you thought about that both were sent by the king to a broken land filled with directionless people? That when they arrived, the walls of protection were long gone and the inhabitants were totally vulnerable to all types of enemy aggression. Both Jesus and Nehemiah offered restoration and peace and hope for a future. They armed their people to defend themselves against their adversary while simultaneously equipping them with the necessary tools to carry out the task at hand. But Nehemiah's work, though impressive, pales in comparison to the work of Christ. It is because of Christ's life, death, and resurrection that we have been afforded victory over the sin which leads to death. Combating sin would be categorically impossible on our own. We are not wise enough. We are not disciplined enough to do something like that. It is only because of the sacrifice of Jesus and the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit that we can be transformed into completely new creatures. If I could have the worship team join me back up on stage, please. If you are here today and you have not yet surrendered your life to Jesus, I want to let you know it is the best decision you could ever make. Hands down, no comparison. The broken walls and the fragmented identity that you've been wrestling with can be restored tenfold if you would only allow him to be Lord over your life. I'm going to be in the back during worship. If you want to ask more questions about what that step looks like or the process or the reason, come talk to me. You can write a little note and drop it in the offering box so we can connect with you throughout the week. Now, if you're here this morning and you've already confessed your faith in Jesus, but you're struggling silently under an attack from the enemy, let your community in. Allow us to pray over your circumstances and hold you up and speak words of truth to you. We are only a trumpet call away. A life spent in service of Jesus is not an easy one. It requires labor and grit and sweat but there is no sweeter reward than to know him. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. Please bow with me for a word of prayer. Father, we are amazed by you. You didn't need us to help build your kingdom. You don't need anything or anyone Yet we have been invited to work alongside you. Us, a group of rebels, misfits, and 'er ne'er-do-wells. You commissioned this bunch of sinners saved by grace to spread the good news of Jesus to the world. Thank you for the sword of your word and the shovel of our life's calling. Though the lion prowls about, we trust that you will be our fierce defender. To you, Lord, belongs all the honor and the glory and the power forever. Amen. No, no.
up your families and for a new ministry in your workplace. Let's start Monday with a brand new vision. Amen? All right. Awesome. So I have some announcements for you today. My friend Ben's going to be coming up and joining me to share with you. First off, this one's a little bit far away, but there's some things that you need to know uh, for this event coming up. There's an Adventure Dome Adventures event coming up. Yes, and this was specifically for our youth. However, we are going to open it up to our entire church family. So this is going to be on July 12th, and we are receiving special pricing, but we have to have a minimum of 15 people to join us. And this is why we're sharing this now. Those deposits are going to need to be in by July 10th to Miss Dana. So here's the details. This is going to happen on July 12th. The youth will be chaperones. If you want to drop off a youth and then go have a day for yourself, go for it. So youth is defined as middle school on up. Um, if you have a student who is 11 or younger, you may come with them. Parents, um, they would need to be accompanied. However, parents, you don't have to pay to stay. If you're not writing, you don't have to pay. Um, $45 is the cost for anyone over 45 inches tall. $22 is the cost for anyone 33 to 48 inches. So those are all of the details. You can see Ms. Dana. If you'd like to participate, adults, if you just want to come and hang out with us, come on out and join us. Whether you have kids or not, we'd love to have you there. Wow. Thank you for going first. Yes. Whew, that was you a lot got of detail. That. <laughs> all right. And now I understand why I'm second. Okay. Uh, July 12th, we have a partner's annual luncheon after service. So I believe that's the, the second Sunday of uh, July, uh, or not July 12th, July 10th. There July you go, yeah. One. Wow, I had one job. That's all right. You still have more jobs. Yeah. You right. can recover. You, you're good. Yeah. Okay, recover. July 10th, there is a partner's lunch after service. There's going to be games, awards, trivia, and even some prizes. Yeah, prizes. Yeah. Do you guys like prizes? All right, 
And I expect a packed house because I just heard a lot of woohoos. Cool. And yeah. then in addition to all the fun and the games, PC will be laying out the plan for 2022, 2023, and also some discussion around our new church site. That's awesome. It's going to be a fun-filled event. So make sure you mark your calendars July 10th. You're going to be here a little bit late that day. It's good because it's going to be fun and there's food. All right. So Rock Olympics is also coming up. So the Rock Olympics, what does that look like? There might be a food eating contest. There might be popping some balloons. Um, it's going to be ridiculous. It's going to be a lot of fun. There's going to be a lot of laughter. Um, so what defines a family? I was asked that question earlier. Two or more people. It can be a friend that you bring with you. It's just got to be a group of people. So we are going to need at least six families or groups for the Rock Olympics. This is happening on July 8th from 6 to 8 p.m. here at the church building. And it's going to be family or group versus family or group. Um, there might even be brackets. It's just going to be a ton of fun. So don't miss out on that opportunity. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, here we go. I promised Crystal I would do this, so bear with me. Ladies, it's the Rock's new women's SG. It is starting on July 2nd. It'll be Saturdays from 8 to 9.30 in the morning. It's going to be hosted and ran by yours truly. Yes, Crystal. yes, yes. So please so, see Crystal if you have questions. Yes, come and see me if you uh, are free on Saturday mornings. We'd love to have you join us. Um, youth bowling event is also coming up on June 18th from 3.30 to 6 p.m. So this is in the evening. Um, this is for youth only. So uh, sixth grade up, even young adults are welcome to come out. The cost is $15, and this pays for shoes, two games, and some food. Dana is your contact person for this, so if you have a youth, or you are a youth, and you'd like to come, make sure you check in with Dana. Cool. All right, and then lastly, this coming Friday, June 17th, brace yourself. I saw you getting excited about the food over there, so watch this. <laughs> Bake your face off this Friday, June 17th, from 9 to 10 in the morning at the Nowries. Yes. Uh, I don't know if you want to add some more detail to that, but it, lots of baking till your face is off. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be so much fun. Parents, I promise your kids will be returned with their faces. Promise, promise. So at our house, we're going to be uh, making some baked goods for Father's Day this coming weekend. We want to celebrate our fathers in the house. Um, so your kids, rock kiddos, are going to be baking for you on Friday, and we'll bring those to church on Sunday. And our youth is also going to be helping with a breakfast service next Sunday. So make sure that you're coming before church um, to get a breakfast here at the church. We'd love for all of our fathers to come out so we can serve y'all. And then we also have our tithes and offerings. So we don't want to miss this because this is an important part of discipleship. This is also an important part of just serving and loving our God because he's given us everything that we need. Amen. All right, so 10% of that goes back to him. It's his anyways in our ties. Our ties box is in the back right here on the counter, and there's another one on your way out. And then offerings is anything on top of that 10% that you choose to give. So both of those will go into the boxes if you um, would like to on your way out. Um, and that is all the announcements we have. That was a lot of announcements. I think Ben did a great job. What do you guys think? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. <laughs> all right. So I hope each and every, well, every one of you have an awesome week. Don't forget to walk it out this week. I'm glad that you're here. And now we get the opportunity to walk it out. We'll enjoy some fellowship, enjoy some snacks, and we'll see you guys next week.